I think when we saw a bunch of the Solana ecosystem leaders move to other chains, the narrative was always, I'm going to Ethereum or I'm going to Polygon. It's, I, I'm moving. And in some cases, it was like, I'm removing all of my Solana association and, and replacing it with Ethereum association, or whatever. And to me, that's like totally the wrong way to think about it. It's like, you don't want to like replace one pie for another pie. You want to have both pies at the same time, right? Especially if you're, you know, a startup trying to grow. It's less about me going to other chains and it's more about like, well, bringing other chains to us. Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Lightspeed. Today we are joined by Armani Ferrante, the founder behind Backpack, XNFTs, Mad Lads, Coral, and the Anchor Development Framework. The guy's a beast. Armani, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I want to get right into it. We're the gatekeepers of the crypto ecosystem, which are wallets. Um, today, when you think about wallets, often people relate to MetaMask, Phantom, Kepler, there's a few others, all competing to win the end user relationship. What do people misunderstand about wallets? Oh, great question. What do people misunderstand about wallets? I think, I don't know if people misunderstand anything in particular, but I do think there are some maybe unfulfilled responsibilities of most wallets. Um, I think a wallet is basically the gateway. It's the entry point to any L1 ecosystem. And so an L1 is only, only as good as its best wallet, right? And so I think, I mean, we, you bring up MetaMask as an example, not to be like too harsh on them, but I, th I think it's important for <laughs> for wallets to evolve at the same pace that the ecosystem evolves at. And I think, you know, uh, in the Solana ecosystem, you know, Anatoly is constantly talking about Solana in the context of like, I don't know, some constantly evolving open source software, not something that like ossifies, right? Um, and so there's constantly new protocols uh, that are being created, new things like, you know, priority fees, new things like, you know, NFT protocols, um, interfaces, um, you know, DAS standards, um, all of these things, right? And I think that it's a wallet's responsibility to keep up. And I think that's one of the most not misunderstood things, but one of the least talked about things uh, about the growth potential of any given L1 ecosystem. So it seems like you're, you know, basically saying that L1s kind of move fast, right? And it's on the wallet to kind of keep up with those features to really showcase the chain. Otherwise, you're kind of falling behind. And I think we've seen this um, on Solana. And I think probably one thing that helps a lot with that is the fact that Backpack is actually open source. Uh, and, and so people can actually make contributions. Was that, was that the main kind of driver behind that decision? Or like, what do you think? Because there has been some successful loss without open source support on Solana as well. What do you think the reason there is? I think a lot of people misunderstand my view or take on open source. I actually don't really care if things are open source or not. I care a lot about honesty and consistency. And so you have to keep in mind that, well, the wallet is the central touch point. It's the central piece of point of trust in a crypto ecosystem. It's like, okay, sure. Like the core protocol has to be safe and secure. Smart contracts have to be safe and secure. But really the wallet is the thing that's managing the private keys. And when you sign something, right? You're putting all of your eggs into that basket. And so if, you're, if we're going to go out and like promote these permissionless systems, mm -hmm. well, it's pretty important to know what the wallet is doing. And so from that point of view, it's quite valuable for a wallet to be open source and that's, or, or not even open source, source available. Um, and, and, and that is the reason why we started with Backpack being kind of having a source available. If it wasn't in crypto, if, if, if we were like building a wallet for, I don't know, Apple, uh, or Visa or MasterCard or whatever, uh, it probably wouldn't be um, open source. But it really is just about this point of like intellectual honesty and like consistency with what we're building. And that's really where it's coming from. Yeah, Armani, on that, I want to get into Backpack. And I, I really like how you describe how being a wallet as they are today is almost table stakes. And you relate that to the iPhone. I'm wondering if you can describe that analogy that you have for the audience and then give us a high level of what Backpack is. Yeah, so I mean, the story I like to give is when the iPhone first came out, how like was, how is Steve Jobs talking about it, right? Um, he called it as like, I don't know, it's like this internet computing advice. It's like, okay, well, like, what does that mean, right? Um, you know, you had phones at the time, you had like Blackberries, you know, that was like probably the closest thing to a smartphone. And it's like, okay, you can call and text people. It's like, but that's not exactly right. Because an iPhone could do so much more than just call and text people. You have... This like rich developer ecosystem. You have an app store. You have browsers. Uh, you have the ability to access rich on-device capabilities, and like 
any one of those things can describe an iPhone, but none of them are necessarily correct. It's like internet computing device. What does that mean? It's like a router, is it a switch? It's not a browser, but there's a browser in it. It's like all these different things, right? And so you ask the question, well, like, what's an iPhone? Well, it's like, I don't know. You put all these things together and what comes out? It's like, I don't know, the iPhone comes out. And I think that is kind of the orientation when thinking about kind of a wallet, right? It's like, it's not like an asset manager, even though like, you know, the majority of the value today comes from gating access to your private keys and managing your tokens and your NFTs. But really what it is, it's like a blockchain computing device, if you want to call it that, put in those terms. It's like the central point of, central, central touch point that gives you access to all of the data and the blockchain, right? And so with Backpack, we've taken the approach where the starting goal is like thinking about how do we get every protocol and every blockchain inside of a single user interface and take this kind of iPhone-esque approach where you can build an awesome flagship consumer kind of product and do it in a way that positions it more as a platform and as an open ecosystem that anybody can build on. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on this topic, actually, I do have, because you're obviously a pretty well-known and, uh, you know, let's say, let's say a founder that I align myself with a lot. I, I look up to you in, 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 in most of your takes. Um, one thing that's interesting in the fact that you mentioned Apple kind of brings me back because I was actually at BlackBerry and BlackBerry was trying to compete with Apple and obviously that didn't work out so well. Um, obviously, wallets are super competitive right now. Um, or maybe, I don't know if competitive is the right word, but there's a lot of wallets out there. How do you as a founder think about competition broadly, but also specifically in as it relates to wallets? I think the name of the game is demand generation. It doesn't matter what you're building. I think block space is abundant. I think there's a lot of incredible infrastructure out there nowadays, especially you know on Solana. But I think demand is, from my point of view, the thing that I've prioritized. It's like, how do you generate demand? And whoever can generate demand can operate in Greenfield. And there's a ton of wallets out there. There's a ton of NFT marketplaces out there. Those are kind of like the two products that I would point to as like the single most competitive knife fights in crypto. That's because the barrier entries of both of them are low. There's not really any any moat in, in either of them. You know, there's some distribution effects that's maybe hard to like transfer your private keys over from like MetaMask to Phantom or from Phantom to Backpack or whatever. But you don't have to be competing like that, right? I think it's pretty well understood that the number of users in crypto is relatively low mm -hmm. when looking at, you know, the big flagship consumer applications in Web2. And so as a founder, it's always kind of, maybe it hasn't always been, it is my view as of today <laughs> uh, that, you know, Peter Thiel's right and that competition's for losers and that we should be focusing all of our energy, not on trying to kill our competitors, but on, on growing the pie, so to speak, if you want to put it in those terms. But that's very much how I'm oriented. I don't know, as of right yeah. now. Yeah, that makes sense. And you were talking about how wallets and talking about the iPhone and phone is the table stakes, but there's so much more to it. You talk about what you're doing at Backpack um, to build that network similar to what the iPhone is, where it's not just a wallet, but it goes beyond that. And I, and I think while you answer that, that will probably answer the question, like, why, why would I choose Backpack as a user? Yeah, totally. I mean, there's the, the, the starting impetus of the entire project was really this concept of XNFTs. Well, the idea is really simple, honestly, in my opinion, pretty unimaginative, where instead of just like tokenizing an image, we could tokenize code, right? On-chain, you know, applications or on-chain WeChat mini programs, if you want to put it in those terms, WeChat's like the analogy everybody loves to use in Web3. But let's just tokenize code and have a plugin system where you can have some nice set of APIs and build an application ecosystem around it. It's as simple as that. And you have some nice primitives, right? You have key management as a, as a primitive, the ability to sign transactions, not just on Solana, but anywhere. You have user identity, right? You have some addresses that are associated with you. You have your username. You have maybe a nice profile picture. Maybe you have a, a social graph, right? You have friends, the ability to look up, you know, Mert and Garrett on, on a blockchain, see their address, see what their address is. Maybe go look at their NFTs. Maybe like go propose to barter with them. Maybe bid on one of their NFTs or something like that, right? We can start 
building out this application ecosystem and make our Web3 experiences, you know, as rich or richer than we're, you know, th than we're used to in, in, in Web2, right? Where we're all kind of on this, we're all in the same database, right? But none of the applications are built in a way that kind of leverages it. And so with Backpack and with the wallet, it's really taking the point of view that like there should be much more UI level composability with heterogeneous protocols and apps on a blockchain than currently exists today. So you are a very big proponent of distribution. Um, so in, in the conversation of, you know, is it product or is it distribution? You know, which one as a founder do you, do you focus on? So you have this tweet, you know, distribution wins. Facebook was just a MySpace clone, which was just a Francis clone with novel distribution through universities and iteration along the way. Is that, can you maybe talk to us about how you think about product and distribution, especially as it, how it relates to crypto and wallets? I think there's many different ways to achieve distribution. And I think wh where that quote is coming from is, I think a lot of, there's a saying that I, I didn't make this up. Some, some thought leader VC in Silicon Valley made this up where first time founders focus on product and second time founders focus on distribution. And I think... Uh, that's very much how I feel, but I think also good product can lead to good distribution, particularly when you're operating, when you're first mover operating in Greenfield, right? So like, you know, Bitcoin got distribution because it was the first blockchain and now it's the most powerful meme. And it doesn't matter what you think about the tech. It doesn't matter if you think it's slow. It doesn't matter if you think it has any real world use case. It's not going to go anywhere. It's probably never going to go anywhere. It's the strongest brand in crypto. And that's because it has distribution on, on, on the meme. And that's that's zero sum. There can't be another Bitcoin. Um, some will try. There's some like meme coins. Maybe Dogecoin is the closest thing where it was able to carve out its own meme, where it's like, you know, it's not necessarily the decentralized censorship resistant store of value, but it's like the cute dog or whatever. We all kind of laugh and play and and, and it moves. But I mm. think. Both of those things are are good examples of of distribution winning, and it was, and it, and it was, it, you know, it happened. That distribution happened because it was innovative, right? It was for their first movers. Bitcoin was the first proof of work chain, and 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 Dogecoin was the first meme coin. So yeah, so yeah, I think product is important. But with that said, you know, I think very rarely does the first mover always win, right? You, I think, in the context we're talking about that tweet in the context of threads, where a lot of people were looking at threads and I doing what I did as you know, a teenager when I saw MySpace and when I saw Facebook come up, I was like, all my friends were going to Facebook. I'm like, why are all my friends going to Facebook? Like MySpace is great. Like it's, it's a better product. Like we're all here, you know, you can play music, Facebook, you can even play music, right? It's like, why are we like doing the exact same thing, but on another platform um, in, a, in a way that's like maybe less compelling. And, and, and you know, I don't, can't think of any good example, any good reason other than, well, that's what like all the cool kids were doing, right? Because I don't know, all, all the colleges were doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And so everybody moved over like almost overnight. Honestly, that was like probably like the, that's burned into my head. I don't know why mm -hmm. it is, but it like, maybe I loved MySpace so much. I like love music. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was like, really wanted my, my top eight profile uh, and my carefully curated CSS uh, to <laughs> not go away. But um I think that's, I, I think it's super important. It's like, why is Threads useful? Or why is Threads interesting? I think a lot of people are mid-curving it. There's like, oh yeah, the, you know, the network effects on Twitter, all the smart people are on Twitter, all of our followers on Twitter, let's just stay on Twitter. But it's like, no, that, that's missing the point. The reason why Threads is really important is because you get this entirely new set of people that weren't otherwise using Twitter now exposed to this form factor. I think it's kind of safe to say that like the set of people, at least, in my network, the set of people that are using Twitter is mostly disjoint from the set of people using Instagram and Facebook. It's like very self-selected group of weirdos that are in the Twitter sphere that I think we could all relate to. Mm -hmm. um, Instagram's very flashy, right? You want to show photos. You want to, you know, it, it's look how awesome my life is. Twitter's like a war zone, right? We're all going to debate and 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 get into fights with people um, that are, you know, anonymous mm -hmm. on the internet. But my with, when threats came, <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex ex exactly. You know, Mert. But when Threads came around, what I looked at it, I, I, I saw an opportunity to grow 
my own personal following and network, right? Where I'm like, oh, like all the people that use Instagram, they have no idea who I am. They have no idea what my tweets are. Uh, and we've sharpened our knives and 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 trained with this interesting form factor. And now it's being applied to this new you know, network, right? Everybody on Facebook and Instagram. And so I saw that as like an opportunity to not kill Twitter, but to bootstrap off that existing network effect and apply the form factor to it. And to me, that's why it was exciting. It's like distribution at a new level, especially because Instagram and Facebook have, I don't know, at least an order of magnitude more users than Twitter does. Mm. When, you, when you think about threads, like I, I just got a threads a few days ago and you know, it's connected to your Instagram, which you see some people don't really like, it like, doesn't matter or not. How do you think about that in crypto? Because um, people talk about like, do you want to have one identity that's used across different apps? And it is true. Like I'm a different person on Instagram than I am on Snapchat than on Twitter and LinkedIn. Is that something that you can do on Backpack or how do you think that can work in crypto? I think with Backpack, we took a very restrictive small first step where we said, let's just be pseudo anonymous and use NFTs only as profile picks. So it's very, it's very Twitter-esque. Um, because that's a one-way door. As soon as you start introducing real identity, you don't go back. And so that was kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have like a super comprehensive view on what the correct answer is, but we very much are trying to keep our options open open there. Um, and NFTs and pseudo-anonymity is what makes crypto special, I feel. So it makes the mm. subculture um, unique. It might not always be that way, but it's certainly what makes it special today. So talk, while we're on the topic of maybe threads versus Twitter. I think maybe an interesting parallel is kind of multi-chain versus picking a single chain. And while we're also on the topic of distribution, how do you think about, you know, as a wallet, you're obviously, you're actually multi-chain. Uh, you, you are on Solana and Ethereum. What do you think is the right thing to do in terms of distribution? Do you, should, should the products go to different chains to increase their distribution? Or should their main goal be attracting people to come onto that chain because most people aren't in crypto to begin with? I think neither. I think, I think, I mean, not to throw too much shade at anybody in particular, but I think when we saw a bunch of the Solana ecosystem leaders move to other chains, the narrative was always, I'm going to Ethereum or I'm going to Polygon, right? So I, I'm moving. And in some cases it was like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm removing all of my Solana association and, and replacing it with Ethereum association, or whatever. And to me, that's like totally the wrong way to think about it. It's like you don't want to like replace one pie for another pie. You want to you want to have both pies at the same time, right? Especially if you're you know a startup trying to grow. Um, and so, from my point of view, it's less about me going to other chains, and it's more about like well, bringing other chains to us, right? And you saw this with like the Mad Lads drop where. You know, we got a bunch of folks from Ethereum just because, you know, we started in Ethereum. We know a lot of folks in Ethereum and, and we had them come to Backpack, get some soul, download the app and mint. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, they thought Mad Lads was cool. Backpack was an interesting experiment and we, we want to bring them to us. Right. Um, and so I think that is like the moral orientation and, and maybe the best product that you see this in is just exchanges. Right. Nobody views Coinbase as like an Ethereum or a Bitcoin or a Solana project. Right. It's just Coinbase. And I think that's the positioning that people should take, especially with NFT projects. I, I feel like NFTs in particular, like that world. I mean, the, the, I guess there is um, a, a, a lot of tribalism, but I, I feel like the biggest NFT projects won't be associated with any given chain. It's like if Disney wanted to create an NFT project, it'd be the biggest NFT project in the world. And nobody would view it as like an Ethereum thing or a Solana thing. They would just view it as Disney. And I think that's the scale that you need to get to if you're like a venture back startup. And that's not really a way that a lot of people are oriented today. Mm. On that thought on distribution, what do you think backpacks like key feature is? to win, I don't know if it only if it'd be users from MetaMask or the new users that come into the ecosystem. And to me, I think maybe part of that is I've heard you say that mobile is like the most important uh, computing paradigm that exists right now. And then that's something that it seems that backpacks focus on that other wallets like MetaMask are maybe missing out. Yeah, I think getting distribute. there's a bunch of novel ways to get distribution, but it basically boils down to how do you get people into crypto that aren't currently in crypto? That's basically what you want to do. And I think there's a 
bunch of different ways we've been thinking about it. The first way it was like, all right, let's just experiment with wacky new, new ideas. So like XNFT, so it's like the first wacky new idea. Um, Mad Lads was like the second big component to that where we thought to ourselves, all right, let's just like try to build a native Web3 kind of brand. But then let's throw out the whole Web3 part and let's just like build a normal brand. Let's like build our own version of Red Bull. And then like, if that's dope and cool and we have cool content and we have a bunch of like people that like, I don't know, big wave surfing and jackass content and motocross and snowboarding and, and stuff like this, then like, they'll probably also like crypto as well. And like, let's introduce them to the crypto part later, but let's like separate the brand, separate the brand from backpack and spin off mad lads. It's in the same company, same set of people, but we very intentionally separated those two things so that we can get distribution on a non crypto level. Um, and then, and then use that as like a top of funnel to bring down into crypto. And that was like a very intentional thing. Uh, NFTs, it's kind of its own world and its own kind of strategic considerations. And it's, own storytelling and its own form of marketing and building product and stuff like that of that. But I think that was one small example of like something that, that we started to do. Um, and so that's kind of like running a, as its own kind of life form at this point. And then there's a bunch of kind of other new product things like, you know, you got to build new things that have never been done before. That's basically what it comes down to. If you're building things that have been done before, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. um, and the wallet is very much just like the table stakes starting point for a lot of this stuff. So things like soul abstraction are like new ideas, right? Where it's like, all right, well, we have all these things. We have smart contracts. We have um, a wallet. We have XNFTs. What happens when you put all three of those things together? And then out of that, you you need all three of those things to, to get soul abstraction. I can talk about that uh, later. But um, so, so yeah, these are kind of like what were some of the first early ideas. Um, and we certainly haven't succeeded. We haven't gotten to the point that we want to get to yet. But the, this is certainly how we're thinking about it. And there's a bunch of other miscellaneous kind of experiments that we're trying to kind of do to like kind of figure out how we can build new things, right? Things like the social graph on backpack, things like messaging, things like NFT gated group chats, all these like kind of basic things that, it, that are valuable from the point of view of like less of I'm trying to beat Telegram and more of coming at it from the perspective of like, oh, I'm already on a blockchain. I'm already have a wallet. How can I make use of that to do things like, I don't know, peer to peer NFT barter? Right. Um, and so it's like these kind of new like products that a lot, not a lot of people have really done before, surprisingly. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's coming out like in the next year that we're working on, like new product experiments. A couple, there's a couple of no brainer things, I think, yeah. that if you think about it really hard in the context of a wallet, it will pop out of your head. Hey everyone, we'll get back to the show in a minute, but I want to let you know that we've got a permissionless conference coming up. This is our conference with Bankless. That is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year. Yep, I know you love it. They got tacos, barbecue, Barton Springs. They got it all. September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while. You know that the bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the ones where all the alphas had. The people that are still in crypto all really want to be there. It's going to be great for building a network, for learning a lot. And look, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers that include people like Hasu, Stani, Christine Moy, and Kyle Samani. Talking about ZK Tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, app chains, and more. Look, I'm damn excited. Because you're a listener of Lightspeed, you're going to get a special discount. Type in discount code Lightspeed30 and you'll get 30% off your ticket. That's right. Just type in Lightspeed30 when buying a permissionless ticket and get 30% off. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices are going up every two weeks. All right, back to the show. So you have Saga and you have an app store and you can develop apps there for, for crypto projects. And then you have XNFTs. And I think I've heard you say that XNFTs could show up in that app store as well. Like it just wouldn't be on Backpack. Um, why, I guess, if you have an XNFT of a project or a protocol, and then you also have like a native app to say something like an iOS or Android, like why would you use the XNFT like, why would you use the backpack scenario? Because I've heard the, I think the, I don't know if he's the founder or one of the people that worked on the Saga phone, he talks about how native apps can take advantage of like the iPhone capabilities and so forth that XNFTs can't. So I'm just curious how you think about that on how a native app versus an XNFT would win and why you would pick one or the other. Yeah, I think, I mean, they're definitely not mutually exclusive. I mean, all an XNFT is, it's a special file format. That's it. Um, an NFT is just a file. Um, and what's in that file and what it points to is more or less up to you. I think it can be a native app. It can be a website. It can be mm. your Oculus goggle binary. It can be your, you know, Apple CarPlay kind of system. It's up to you. Um, I think the main difference at the product level is that 
XNFTs as they're currently built auto connect to wallets. So you remove that point of friction. Uh, but beyond that, maybe the best analogy is thinking about native iOS, Android apps versus WeChat mini programs. That's basically mm-hmm. what it is, right? Where you have apps that hook into something, um, an existing ecosystem or Facebook games or Facebook plugins, messaging plugins, iMessage plugins. Those are, those are all XNFTs. Um, and that's more or less how I, how I think about the difference between the two. Gotcha. But they're more or less isomorphic if you want them to be. Nice. Big word, isomorphic. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, we, we need to drop a few more of those. Um, well, so okay, you just mentioned, or not just mentioned, but you just talked about how you, you guys actually started in Ethereum and then kind of came over to Solana. So let's, let's kind of dig into that. Why Solana? I think, okay, so context came into crypto, I think 2017, started on Ethereum, started working on L2s, was really interested in um, scaling solutions, right? At the time, Ethereum, the whole concept of the world computer was like the coolest idea ever. Just like brought in like every kind of engineer into the space. I was interested in like making computers go fast. Um, and at the time, a bunch of L1s got funded. Solana was, was one of those because the prospect an idea of a world computer was like the most exciting thing at the time, but it was very much an unfulfilled dream. And so the Ethereum community started thinking about all this stuff, um, namely started thinking in two directions. The first direction was sharding um, and the second direction was L2s. Um, I pretty quickly like didn't like the idea of sharding um, for various reasons, don't have to go into them, um, but I thought um, L2s are pretty cool. So I started exploring and learning about L2s. Um, and started, you know, looking into state channels, looking into plasma. These are kind of things that were like kind of the early ideas that were the precursors into what became rollups, which is now like the dominant kind of Ethereum um, scaling narrative at this point. And I thought to myself, well, like there's, I don't know, got to be other more traditional ways of doing this. I felt like in hindsight, I think a lot of the ideas at the time were thinking about all of this crazy, like new like language, like crypto economics and fraud proofs and and all of this like crazy stuff at the times, but nobody was thinking, oh, how do we just like build a parallel transaction transaction processing system that like every other database in the world uses? Um, and, and so started looking for kind of like new L1s uh, about that time. The first one that I found was uh, Oasis. Uh, Oasis was a company that spun out of um, a research group at Berkeley. Um, and the whole idea there was, well, Sharding has like fixed scaling um, throughput, right? Because you can't shard a shard. Eventually, you have, if you have like a fixed number of shards, it's a constant, uh, you know, a constant sized uh, performance in- input, and then that's the upper bound, and you don't go beyond that, right? And so they thought, okay, well, instead of scaling with sharding, what if you scale with like multiple different tender mint committees, and then you have linear sharding with, or no, excuse me, linear scaling with respect to these groups. Um, and as long as the rewrite sets don't conflict, then you get like infinite scaling. Um, and that was, that was the first kind of idea. It's like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool idea. That sounds like morally speaking, the right way to think about it, right? Scaling in every other sense of the term is linear. It's not like some constant increase. Um, and so that was the first kind of company I, I joined that was like outside of the Ethereum ecosystem where we were exploring these kind of like new ideas that didn't work out for a bunch of reasons. Turns out building L1s is really hard and building startups is really hard. Um, and then Solana was the next one that I saw that had this same property, except it was linear with respect to hardware um, and, and, and you know, using kind of these kind of more traditional kind of systems techniques. Um, and that was basically what drew me to it at the beginning. And so you you obviously like when you joined, it was it was the early days, right? Like there was nobody there. Just everything was pretty awful. And and you were kind of like, I remember you had a tweet about like, um, if if you're at the stage where the docs are already there, you're too late. Like this is kind of the opportunity. Like, why did you stick around? Why did you why were you like, okay, I'm gonna build anchor for this network? I believe in it. Um, is it just because like Tolly is very handsome? Like, what is the <laughs> rationale for, for uh, why should you stick around? That is a great question. Okay, so people seem to forget how extraordinary the initial conditions for Solana are. 
they're like truly incredible, like very hard to recreate, might be impossible to recreate. So the historical context is it was about, I think when I started paying attention, it was summer 2020, DeFi summer. This was the start of like the last major bull market where we were riding off of the extreme moral lows of the bear market. You know, 2017, 2018 were great times. 2019 started to get scary and basically everybody started leaving crypto. And that bear market, I don't know if you guys remember this, it felt morally so much worse than this bear market. Mm. It felt like we weren't sure if this thing is actually going to actually stay around. Um, Now it's like, we all kind of know crypto is not going anywhere. There's people that like to, you know, saving things online, but you know, it's too big at this point to where the cat's out of the bag, but it really felt like we were, it really felt like this isn't going anywhere. Um, and then DeFi summer happened and Mm -hmm. everyone and seemingly their mother were yield farming vegetables. (laughs) Um, and (laughs) you know, and, and SBF in particular had this, incredible saga with the sushi swap vampire attack and then chef nomi and maki's kind of chef nomi i guess fall fall from grace right where they vampire they successfully vampire attack uniswap sushi swap goes to the moon everybody uh loves it and then all of a sudden the founder seemingly rugs and then you know sbf is like the prince of crypto at the time it's crazy to say this out loud it's absolutely insane to say this out loud but but this is what people were thinking it's like at the time he was the god he, everybody loved him everybody was talking about him as like the the savior of of defi summer and crypto right he's this like genius kind of um trader that was yield farming to valhalla and making all this money um and i was work i before FTX started, I was actually at Alameda uh, for three months. So um, between my time leaving Apple and going into Ethereum land, I had this like three month stint where when Alameda was very first getting started trading in crypto, um, uh, I was working on the trading systems there. I left because you know I was more interested in working on Ethereum than I was in doing um, you know building mar- a market maker. But I digress. Anyway, so. Um, but but people were were or I, I particularly saw this at the time and, and you know it was it was it was like this incredible thing where you know we're, we're back the bull market seems to be coming back um, and and this thing called Solano was created right and the promise at the time was an on chain decentralized censorship resistant immutable nasdaq and that was just like the coolest thing ever it's like okay uniswap was the big thing at the time sushi swap came around it showed how much excitement and passion there was for DeFi. everybody was yield farming but we can bring this up a whole nother level by using order books like amms are capital inefficient order books is like what the the regular world uses like everybody that was interested in trading um and was taking a look at kind of DeFi. i was like well, why don't these things exist? And it turned out, well, you need a fast blockchain and that blockchain now exists. Um, And so this was the narrative at the time that was just super exciting. It brought in so many people from TradFi, people not only from from DeFi on Ethereum, but also people from, you know, Jump came in, um, folks from Citadel came in, like all these more traditional trading firms just started kind of looking at the space and people, a lot of really smart engineers started looking at Solana for this reason. It's very different now than it was back then, but now it's like Solana is very much an NFT chain. But back then it was very much like we're uh, people who identified as traders went to Solana to explore DeFi. And you had this, inc- you know, incredibly well capitalized um, backer, right? That invested heavily into the chain. SBF was on Twitter saying, you know, I'll buy all your soul at $3, like give it to me or fuck off or whatever. You know, he was you know, the golden child of the industry pumping all of this capital and in, into and in time into Solana. It was just like, I don't know. It, it, it was just like a really special point in time for a new network. I mean, in hindsight, again, it's crazy to say that with everything that we know today, but you know, at the time, if you put yourselves in the shoes of your, the regular person in crypto, this was a, a, a really magical kind of 
six month period where everything kind of started. You talked about how when Anatoly was first building Solana, it was positioned as the NASDAQ on chain. And you just said that now it's an NFT chain in a way. Is that how you think Solana should position itself? Or what do you think the branding is for Solana? Because it seemed to change over the last year. I kind of like fundamentally believe that you don't choose product market fit. Product market fit chooses you. And that very much is what happened with NFTs, especially given the network downtime. Like DeFi just doesn't work if the network's down. I mean, that's been changing significantly over the past year. It's been a ton of really incredible improvements to the core network where DeFi 2.0, as people are, are calling it on Twitter these days, is coming back on Solana. And I think we'll see a rebirth. I mean, I'm optimistic. Who knows what will happen? But I would love to see a rebirth and resurgence and energy being put into it because I do think that recreating all of the very, very flawed you know, economic engines of the world on something like a blockchain just makes a ton of sense. And so I do think we'll see that change over time. But NFTs were just so exciting and, and it was such a great way to get people into crypto that it chose Solana because it was fast, right? And 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 I think it's hard to say what will happen in the future, but I think there's a lot of desire to bring DeFi back. You, you said product market fit chooses you, right? It's like maybe the, the, the wand in Harry Potter. Um, what do you think about Metaplex? Just for some context to the read or listeners, Metaplex, I'm, I'm just going to do a quick uh, crash course here. On Ethereum, you have standards and interfaces and um, the NFT standard is, 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 is a shared interface that anybody can kind of inherit from. But on Solana, um, you have kind of these centralization risks with one program kind of controlling the entire landscape until interfaces go live. And to date, um, all NFTs on Solana have went through the Metaplex program. Um, so that's kind of Metaplex's role in this. So what, what do you think about them? Do you think um, they, they've done a good job so far? How would you like to see the Solana NFT ecosystem evolve going forward? I think that they built something that became so popular that it outgrew them. That, that's basically how I feel about it. Um, and it and it exposed not a problem with them. It exposed a problem with Solana, which is that Solana does not have either the tooling or the social processes to create robust interfaces, which is a super important piece of social technology as much as it is a piece of developer technology to be able to solve a lot of these messy human level problems. I don't think any of us on the network think that it's a good idea that a single for-profit entity can control the asset standard for the entire ecosystem of, you know, uh, 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 of players, right? It just creates so many problems, especially when you're trying to build a competitive business that might be competing with the owner of that. Like you can't, that this is maybe a, a point that is often overlooked, but a lot of people think that like open source happens because people want to feel warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, open source often happens. There's some people that are passionate about it and there's, you know, incredible folks like, I don't know, Free Software Foundation that like fundamentally believe that, it, that it's important, but it really comes down to incentives, I feel, where if you want a bunch of competitive, disparate businesses like let's say Google, Apple, Mozilla, uh, et cetera, Brave, you know, you need neutral standards so that they can put the future of their business on it, right? They can bet on it, right? They know it's not going to get pulled out from under them in an anti-competitive way. And only with that can you have buy-in. And I think that's super important. And that is the piece that is that was missing and that Metaplex or all of the associated Metaplex problems exposed on Solana. And I think the solutions are there. I think we just need to execute on them as an ecosystem. And I don't think it was anything specific to them other than they just ended up being so freaking successful. Or at least NFTs ended up being so freaking successful. Yeah. And is it is it right just for people that don't understand interfaces and we won't go into it too much, but like without an interface that's adopted throughout the ecosystem right now, if you launch an FT and you don't do it through Metaplex, it just won't even show up on Magic Eden, for example. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. 
I think one thing that'd be interesting to me is you were working on Ethereum or in the Ethereum ecosystem. I think that'd be back in like 2018, 19. Um, and that was when the state channels and L2s were really just in a theory, right? And L2s today are launched and they have a high TVL, but they're still on training wheels. How do you feel differently about Ethereum now? Like if you were building in that ecosystem today, do you still think that you would go over to Solana? Because I've heard you mention uh, you think app chains could be like the future of a many like scaled um, applications. And Cosmos embraces that idea. Do you think Ethereum has that right now? And it just didn't at the time. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think so. I don't think, I mean, I, I'm very far removed from the state of the art thinking over there, but from my point of view, they very much have pivoted into this very Cosmos esque view of the world where you have this global settlement layer and then a bunch of disparate rollups, um, on top that all checkpoint and use the settlement layer for things like data availability and fraud proofs and all that stuff. And I, it's funny, people, a lot of everybody in Solana thinks I'm a multi-chain maski. Everybody on other chains think I'm a Solana maxi, but I, I really love the cosmos, this view of the world. I've, I, I very much view the end state for all of the biggest applications to be their own. I don't know what you call it, app chain or roll up or whatever. Like I feel, I feel like that's just a very nice thing to do. It's like if I have, you know, something brand new. Maybe it's like an MMORPG. Maybe it's a big social network. Maybe it's an exchange. Right? There's going to be a lot of unique idiosyncrasies that I'm going to need out of either the runtime or the consensus mechanism or just like the properties of the underlying blockchain where. It makes a lot of sense sometimes to have your own infrastructure layer that optimizes for it, right? Like blockchains, there's databases, right? It's like Kafka, but like, you know, uh, instead of being fault tolerant, it's like Byzantine fault tolerant, right? And like, you don't choose a database when building an app based on like what, it's not like a branding question, right? It's a, what is the set of trade-offs in the design space that I need question, and different things will give you different trade-offs. And this is like so trite at this point, especially for a lot of us in the Solana ecosystem, because like there's not a lot of maximalism. But I think this is why I really love the Cosmos view of the world. It's like, yeah, if I need to customize something, I'm going to go do it and I'm going to do it with my own chain. And I think it makes a ton of sense. So I don't know. It's pretty simple as that. Not particularly creative though. Yeah, I guess when you say that though, then what do you think about the future of Solana in that. And I know I know that's like a long time away, but like there it's a global state, doesn't have to do with app chains. There is the SVM on things like Eclipse and so forth. So yeah, I'm just curious. I think there will be a couple huge L1s with huge network effects thing with very with very specific use cases. I think I don't think you're gonna have a big MMO on Solana. I think if there's a big MMO like World of Warcraft, it'll probably be a separate chain. Um, maybe you put the economy on there or something. Maybe you do like gold or you put the auction house there. Um, but I digress. I do think that the, I said this when I was talking with Austin Federa the other day, I do think one interesting way to think about it is in the context of the programming model. So the reason why something like Solana is so compelling as a developer, like it's so compelling. If I just have to have a smart contract and a Helios subscription, that's it. That's all I need. And I can build applications that, you know, transfer billions of dollars all around the world permissionlessly, verifiably. Like that is incredible. Like that really is like a superpower. It's like maybe one good mental model for thinking about technology is thinking about how it leverages a single developer. And like, if you look at the progression of, of all of the tools that have been built over the past, I don't know, 30 to 50 years, I'm going to say 30 years because I'm 31 years old. <laughs> if you take a look at it, it's like every year, a single developer can do more and more and more all by himself and grow faster and faster and faster, right? You probably used to have to have, you know, millions of dollars to be able to build something like a Facebook or a Google or whatever, right? Facebook had to literally have their own, build their own databases and, you know, manage hardware in their own data centers and do all this crazy stuff, right? Now you can just literally ship a Rust binary 
put it onto a blockchain and it just works. It doesn't go down. You don't have to worry about fault tolerance. You don't have to worry about, I mean, you have to worry about the smart contract and, and make sure that there's no exploits and that's hard. And that's a, its own set of challenges, but you don't have to think about all the infrastructure. And that serverless model is so empowering for a developer, especially if you're building anything remotely related to asset ownership or, you know, economic value transfer that I don't think that's going to go away. And a single global state machine is super compelling from that point of view. And I think, you know, we'll have, I mean, it's, 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 I think it's pretty obvious that we'll have both. And I think systems like rollups and app chains are just super compelling, but for different reasons. To me, they're not compelling for scaling reasons. They're compelling from the point of view of, I want to iterate and build new things that have never been done before. How do I like tweak this to have a like, customize the VM or have my own state logic um, in a way that like, I don't have to go to the base layer and like have a, you know, lobby, you know, the fire dancer and Solana and Mingo team to like all implement this the way I want. Right. If I want to have every single smart contract on my network, be open source and verifiable, I can do that. Right. And I just like, fork uh cosmos or whatever and make that happen but mm -hmm. that is much more of a i don't know business product selling point it's like than it is a scaling selling point like i think coinbase's l2 is like a great example that's basically my view of the world is that just wraps it up right there i don't view l2s as going to be like platforms or ecosystems by themselves i mean there are some like arbitrum and, and optimism, I think they do an incredible job, especially at the social level of getting people excited and stuff like that. But as a developer, I very what Coinbase is doing very much resonates with me. So you're referring to, just, just for people who, who don't have context, Armand is referring to Base, Coinbase's new um, L2. Um, you know, it is weird how bad of a job we've done marketing to developers, right? You can write a few lines of code and you can move money at the speed of light. Um, with no permission and composed with anybody else. And, and so I do wonder what we've gotten wrong there. But uh, maybe on that train of thought, what is something that we should be talking about more in Solana that's just completely under the radar? I wouldn't say I have a good answer to that. What about in crypto? And Armani, just to steal one of your tweets, you said, I've, if I've learned anything from the past six years in this industry, it's that when people scoff at something, you should probably pay attention to it. What's something that people are scoffing at in crypto that they should pay attention to? Yeah, these, these are all the hard questions. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I think that tweet was coming from a place where I have personally, I mean, I, I feel like most developers can, res this will resonate with them, where I see a lot of stuff and I'm so, I'm so, I'm so smart and experienced as a, as a you know, developer that I, I know the entirety of, 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 of mankind's knowledge and I know the future and stuff like that. Right. Um, but I personally have seen a lot of things. I've, I saw it with NFTs where I look at it and I'm like, oh, this is dumb. Right. I'm not getting involved with this. This is, this is so dumb. Um, mm -hmm. and you see these toys, right. Whether it's something like, you know, seeing an AMM for the first time or seeing an NFT for the first time. Or seeing something like uh, you know Bitcoin ordinals for the first time, where it's very easy to like have an, a knee jerk reaction. I personally have had my own share of knee jerk reactions. I will continue to have my own set set of knee jerk reactions, but it's easy to write it off. But it turns out there's like a lot of these things that are just imperfect at the time end up being like really good ideas, and I've just seen it time and time again with ideas in crypto. Solana was like maybe a great example of this. Like when we were, when I came to Sauna for the first time, like it was just a constant battle on Twitter where people were just like making fun of us. It still is. It's still a constant battle on Twitter um, where people are like, it's dumb, it's decentralized, it goes down and nobody's going to use Rust. Um, you know, Anatoly's hair looks funny. I don't know what people want to say. Um, but whether it's NFTs or L1s or, you know, money at the speed of light, if People are using stuff. There's tends to be something interesting. And I think it's worth spending the time to explore what those interesting things are.
So anyway. Well put. Um, okay. I'm going to completely pivot off of crypto. And this is a question I've been meaning to ask because uh, there's no, I found that the best way to piss people off on Twitter is to say working hard is good. Um, what are your thoughts on work-life balance? I feel the problem with these conversations is two things. The first thing is people tend to be prescriptive where they think of it in terms of what's right and what's wrong and what I should be doing versus what others should be doing. And the simple answer to that is like, there's no right answer, right? Everybody is different. And it's all about context and like, what is your goal? Like, what are you trying to do? And if your goal is to build a billion dollar startup, that's very different than if your goal is to just like be happy. Those are two very different things. Like, you know, and I think that's people just aren't really easily like they, people don't, people don't put it in those terms. Right. And that's like kind of how Twitter's designed. They just want to maximize chaos. Um, but once you start putting it in that context and you can have these like conversations that are much more objective. So, you know, for us, we're a venture backed startup. Our goal is to build kind of, you know, fundamental kind of improvements that change the world. Right. Um, and if that's your goal, and if you are competing against a bunch of other people that also have that same goal, that are also really smart, well, the fact of the matter is some people are just going to like work harder than you and they might be smarter than you um, and they, they're they going to do everything in their power to beat you. Like some people are just wired like that. I'm charging my computer right now, so I apologize. Um, so it doesn't go up. And I think people have this... I don't know what, if it's like it, it, what it is. I don't know if it's like insecurity or what, but like they hear these things and they're like, well, if I'm not working really hard, like the problem is not with me, the problem's with you. And I, I think that's kind of where it comes from. Um, I don't have work-life balance. I'm not going to pretend like I do. I don't tell other people to not have work-life balance, but I definitely don't. Um, I work all day, every day, seven days a week, every waking moment of the day. But I don't think that's like the right thing for everybody to do. It's kind of just like how I've always been and how I'm wired. And it's funny because like people will tell you like, oh yeah, you'll burn out or whatever. And I'm just like, no, I've, I've been like this my entire life and I haven't burnt out. It's just like, you know, and, and it's like, I don't know what's worse. Like you telling people to work too much or other people telling you to not work. Mm. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is like, you know, if you're happy, you're happy and, and you should just, nobody has the answer, right? And it's really as simple as that. Yeah, I think that question is probably asked a lot out of insecurity. Either way, you either a lot of people feel they work too much or too less, um, and so yeah, it's an insecurity question. If you if you weren't working in crypto, um, you obviously like to build things all the time, twenty four seven. What else would you be working in? Oh, it's, the answer is so ridiculous. I, it, it, it's just so obvious, right? It's like AI, obviously. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Do you think AI and crypto actually have like? Do you think that's going to come to fruition, or do you think it's way over overblown right now? I feel like it's overblown, but I mean, they solve different problems, right? I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, AI is like the other, obviously, most, ex I mean, in 2017, it was the most exciting thing in addition to crypto. And in 2023, whatever day, we, year it is, I lose track of time. It continues to be the most exciting thing um, next or alongside crypto. What are your thoughts on working in remote or in person versus remote? My thoughts on this have significantly updated since running a company. Um, I think for developers, being remote is totally fine, um, especially if you've worked on a lot of open source. But part of running a, a company is figuring out things along the way. It's like you almost never know the problem that you're solving until you actually start pro pro solving it. And opportunity is like inherently temporal. I, I like the story I like to tell to my team is like opportunity is like these windows of time that open up. It's like an ephemeral Pokemon, if you want to use that analogy, where it pops up out of nowhere and you have, like you know, some fixed period of time to capture it. And if you don't capture the Pokemon before it disappears, you'll never capture it again. And it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how good the product is. If you do it a second after 
the Pokemon disappears, you're not catching that Pokemon. And so time is everything. Um, and not only time, but also all of the micro decisions that you make all day, every day. You do like make a million different decisions, right? Should I be talking to the person next to me? Should I be reviewing code? Should I just be force pushing the master? Should I be reverting this PR? What should I be working on? Should I be focusing on iOS? Should I be focusing on uh, making the system go fast? Should I be, you know, sitting in Discord, getting people hyped? Um, should mm -hmm. I be thinking about the new mints? You know, should I be trying to get BD partnerships um, and, and getting people excited. Like you don't know what to work on, right? And in order for you to actually make good decisions, you need to have all that business context. And mm -hmm. so if if you know what you're doing a priori and you can have a nice like year long roadmap where you are figuring, where, where you know everything and you just need to execute. And I think for some things, like I think, you know, building an L1 blockchain um, that's, 100x faster than the next thing was probably fit in that category. Um, but for other things where, you know, you're trying to find product market fit, that's a lot less objective and a lot more escapable. I think being in person is just a huge, huge advantage. It's just, to me, it's like not even close. And I think there are some of our best engineers are remote, um, no doubt about it. And they would be less productive if they were in person, for sure. Mm. But I think for a lot of folks, particularly non-engineers, being in person is just such a huge advantage. Mm. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, you obviously see your backpack, um, and you you just said your your views on this topic have changed since before starting and, and after. What are what are some leadership lessons you've learned along the way since starting backpack? I mean, I think there's a lot of like boring things like mechanically on like how to like motivate people and, and get pro productivity out of people um, that are maybe less interesting. I think the main th like big thing is that you actually don't know what you're building until you just start building. And the, st the starting point is just like an excuse. Um, like we built backpack as like an excuse to start building stuff. Right. Um, and it's not about where you start. It's about the million decisions and pivots that you make along the way to like end up in a good spot. And I think that is the main thing. So like, yeah, there's a million wallets out there, but if you want to build a wallet, you should just build a wallet because like the point is not going to be the wallet. The point is what comes as you build the wallet and all the things that you learn along that way. And I think that's probably mm -hmm. the, the biggest thing, which is like maybe counterintuitive, um, but it's definitely, I think, um, been a big lesson. The, the big factor is when you raise money. That's the big thing. Um, the challenge is when a lot of people, when you raise money without having that big kind of compelling idea that you have high conviction on. Um, and at that point, then that's when the ordering of operations matters a, a, a bunch there. But yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry to cut you off there. Um, I was going to say, we felt the same way about this podcast. Like you can, you can plan what the description is going to be, what the show is going to be about, who you're going to have on. It's like, you need to just go do it, you know, after a certain point and start executing. Um, I think one interesting story that I heard you talk about was your internship at, at Apple. And, you know, you thought you'd go in and just be coding all day. But I think they made you dedicate like two days or three days to just building presentations. And that probably taught you how important the UX and presenting things is, which I think goes into your conversation about distribution. So I'm just curious, is that something that like changed your outlook on everything and how you go about backpack and distribution? Was that kind of transformative? Because it sounded like it would be. Yeah, it was, it was crazier than that. It was two weeks. It was two weeks of, of, of hammering a presentation every day. Um, it was, wow. yeah, it wasn't two days. It was, it was, it was way gnarlier than that. Um, <laughs> no, it definitely did. It definitely did. Like storytelling is super important to me. Because it doesn't, I mean, these are all just the classic Steve Jobs lessons, right? Where, you know, it's very, it was very much like a parent in the company culture that like, that's what they cared about, right? They cared about not just what you built and how you built it, but also how you presented it to the world. And, you know, little things like, you know, the packaging matter, right? Um, in the context of software, it's maybe not physical packaging, but it's how you talk about it publicly. And so I think small things like Twitter and Twitter spaces and even this podcast are, are really important when 
telling your story and uh, inspiring people to use kind of the technology, right? Because the technology is ultimately like a means to an end. Like you don't build tech for the sake of building tech. I mean, some people do, but people use tech because they care about like the human level of improvements in their life, right? Whether they make something, you know, that you can connect with your friends, uh, you know, and, and be happier, or, you know, you can find information quick, um, or you can like call your mom, you know, when you're, you know, at school or something like that. That's what people care about. It's like that connect, it's a, a human level property and the technology just like facilitates that. And mm-hmm. so it's important to communicate that. And I think that's, that's, that was the takeaway. Yeah. It's really cool. Bert, um, we're coming up on an hour. Do you want to yeah. do your fire round segment? Yeah. All right. So, uh, Armani, I, I, um, we're, we're going to do a rapid fire. Uh, I don't prepare these questions beforehand. I just think of random shit on the spot. So, um, are you, are you ready for that? Just basically, I'm just going to ask some questions and then you're just going to answer as quickly as you can. Let's do it. All right. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's get started. All right. Um, board Ape Yacht Club or D Gods? D Gods. Altus or Cosmos? <laughs> really putting me in the fire yeah, there. That's a good one. <laughs> I, I, I want to say L2s because that's where I started, but I also want to say Cosmos because they're the relative underdog. So I'm going to vote for mm-hmm. Cosmos. Who is one person you look up to in crypto? Vitalik. What is one thing the Solana ecosystem needs to do less? Less. Fight. With who? Each other, other ecosystems, both, yeah. obviously. Yeah, in fi- but both in fighting. Just fo- focus on your customers, focus on shipping, focus on creating value. Don't focus on what people are saying on Twitter. Don't focus on you know trying to win by killing your competitors. Focus on winning by delighting and inspiring your users because there's not that many of them and we need more. If you could steal one personality trait from anybody in history, what would it be? Or who would it be from? So, for example, Steve Jobs' storytelling, etc. I think it would be Steve Jobs' ruthless commitment to building great product above all else, even at the sacrifice of, I don't know, being perceived as kind. I think, yeah, I, I think just... It's not necessarily the most admirable thing, but in terms of my personal composition of like personality traits, I think that would be the most complimentary that would make me improve the most. Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos? Oh, Elon Musk. Yeah, no doubt. Do you have a thing against ball CEOs? <laughs> I'm <assuming. laughs> um, uh, I was going to say, who are your favorite three Twitter follows? Twitter follows. Uh, uh, you're you're a pretty good one. I mean, I'm not just saying that. I think you're pretty. Yeah, I think you you say a lot of things that are thought but not otherwise said, and people are afraid to say. Um, so de- definitely, definitely think you're you're pretty close to the top of the list. Um, Mad lads and backpack accounts. Those are the three. There we go. <laughs> awesome. What is one tip you would give to founders about forming a community like Backpack and Mad Lads? Oh, if it's on the topic of community building, I would say two things. First is focus on purpose and bringing value to the community. It's like, what is it that you're building and why are you building it? Is it to make friends on the internet? Is it to make a compelling product? Is it to, you know, just have a reason for existence? It's not about like making vibes. I mean, there's, there's some, there's some communities around vibes and there's some that pull it off, but that's like saying, you know, being a meme coin is a good idea. It's like, yeah, the Doge exists, but you're probably not Doge. So I think this is where most people go wrong with building communities is it's really all about incentives and you need to have that fundamental incentive there where you can inspire people with your mission, right? It could be, Tesla and, you know, accelerating the transition to a sustainable energy source. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it can be pure branding like Nike, but you got to have a purpose and a story to rally people behind it. 
And then the mm-hmm. second thing is you have to like internally actually believe what that story is. You can't just like write it on a piece of paper and then like say it on Twitter and hire some marketing people and say, oh yeah, I think this is a good idea. This is what people will like, irrespective of whether I like it itself. I think humans are really good BS detectors. People can tell if you're being internally inconsistent or if you're being externally in- inconsistent with your internal views. That really, I don't know what it is, but I feel like humans are incredible at detecting that. And so if you're going to say things and build a community around this purpose, you really need to believe it and be consistent with that view. Um, and it all comes, it's like going back to like why open source, right? It's all about consistency and honesty and like, you know, eating your own cooking, so to speak. And I think that is those two things together are a good combination for, Mm -hmm. you know, aspiring community builders. Mm -hmm. Well said cats or dogs, cats or dogs. I got to go with dogs, (laughs) coffee or tea, coffee, no doubt. If there's one lever you could pull to improve the state of crypto, what would that lever be? One lever. I guess first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, yeah, regulation. Mm. Regulation. What about tech yeah, clear, in general? Clear, clear regulation. Like I need to know. We need to know the rule sets. Um, yeah. And what about what? What is one lever you would pull to improve the state of tech in general? Immigration law. Oh, that's a good one. All right, last question. What is one piece of advice you would give to aspiring founders? Fuck it. <laughs> I Beautiful. Love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, everybody, before we close up, what, what would you tell the audience? Like, what should they check out? Obviously, we'll put your links in the show notes, but what, what would you uh, tell them to do to learn a little bit more about your projects? Yeah, all the basic stuff. Twitter is probably the best place. Go to XNFT underscore backpack on Twitter. Um, Mad Lads NFT, I think, for the for the Mad Lads accounts. Um, those are probably the two best places to get started. And then there's all the other stuff, you know, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, yeah. Chrome Store, Get GitHub repos. Um, you can find all that stuff from the Twitters. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining. This was an amazing first episode of Lightspeed. Armani, you're absolutely killing it in the ecosystem. So I'm so glad you joined. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. Appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you later.